Thank you, Paul. You know, Paul and I have been friends a long time. And uh, in some ways, he may be bigger than me, and that's good, too. But, uh, and I congratulate you on Logan County. You know, I've got a lot, a lot, a lot of roots in southern West Virginia. You know that. And not far from here, my mom and dad grew up. Mom's family never had indoor plumbing. And all the time that I ever visited them, that's just what it was. My dad grew up in a little coal company owned coal camp house in Copperston, an only child. The center of the floor had a big grate in the middle of the house, coal fired furnace, you had to jump across it if you were barefoot. And that's where they lived. Now, I couldn't identify with you any more than anybody could throughout all the state. Now let me just tell you this, let me just tell you just a couple of things, then I'll let I mean I'll be tickled to death to answer your questions as best I can. First of all, I'd be the first to say teachers are underpaid. We all know that. The next thing I'd say is you got 700 plus classrooms in this state that you don't have a teacher in. It's terrible. It's terrible. Every one of these things you've heard for now in well over a year. You heard it on the campaign trail. You've heard it and heard it and heard it. Now, if there's any issue that I have with you, it'll be just this. <coughs> is I always believe that West Virginians are appreciative and loving good people. They represent the truth. And that's all I would expect you to do. Represent the truth. Just think back. Who was the guy that stood up and said, we need to make education our centerpiece? Who was that guy? It's me. Who was the guy that absolutely came into being and we had the good, the good fortune of a lot of state board members that were running everything that you have out of Charleston and the bureaucracy in Charleston made life really tough on us. And bless this lady's heart, I've been, I've been there too. You know, and that's all there is to it. I spent four weeks golfing my blooming head off. And, uh, and that's not very pleasant. So, but in that, here's what we did. We've got a great state superintendent of schools and Steve Payne is right here with you today. We have a phenomenal state board of education. Now, I heard you along the way and delivered. Did I not? I heard you say this testing we do all the time is just driving us crazy and it's just useless time. And what did we do? We got rid of it. I heard you say grading our schools A through F is, is holding us back in all kinds of ways. We got rid of it. I heard you say that we need more local control and absolutely this control in Charleston from your bureaucracy standpoint is driving us all crazy. We got rid of it. The last thing you said, we want more control of our school calendar in the counties. We did it. Did we not do every bit of that? Every single last bit of it. We did something there that honestly has been in the process that has haunted you for decades and decades and decades. Now also, again, all I expect is the truth. Just the truth. You know, I'm the guy that walked right out on day one of the state of the state with a, with a set, of, set of circumstances that was so gloom and dire, it was unbelievable. $500 million deficit, hope gone, all the, 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 the situation just as bad as bad could possibly be, and what did I say? 
I think we need to give the teachers a 2% pay raise. Did I not? I mean, tell the truth. Tell the blue the truth. That's all I ask you. You know, now, here's the thing that bothers me. I get it. I mean, I know that things are tough and trying to make it on $38,000 or $42,000 and your PEIA cost. And, and, and even though it is, let's be fair again, it is an incredible program compared to what you could get in normal private business. Incredible program. You know, the cost that you bear is nothing compared to what anybody else would have to bear in private business. But still, it's money. I get it. I get him a bit of it. Now, here's the other thing I've delivered you. And politics makes you brag. And I'm not that kind of guy. But the reality is just real simple. We in West Virginia have gone from the bottom of the earth with no hope beyond belief to all of a sudden, we are looking like that our heads are above water and we're <coughs> progressing forward and we're growing and we're absolutely, we're there in 12 months. Now, if you have nothing to thank me for in the world, you better thank me for that because your hope level was zero, zero when I walked in the door on day one. And your hope level <coughs> for your jobs and your families is finally a, a real potential. Now, just think about it, and let's just be fair again. If there was somebody else out there on the horizon that was going to fix it, why didn't they do it? Why didn't they do it? Now, the other thing I tell you is this, and you're too smart for this. You're just too smart for this. But whether it be union officials that may row you up or stand and give you a rah-rah speech, or whether it may be politicians that row you up and give you a rah-rah speech, let's just tell the truth again. Tell the truth. While all this was going on last year in the, in, you know, in the session, I was a Democrat. All this is going on in the session. You know, I'm the guy that came up and said we ought to give the teachers a 2% pay raise, and we ought to do this, we ought to put education first. We did all the other things that I wanted to do, get rid of the testing and all that kind of stuff that I've already talked about. I was a Democrat. Now, all of a sudden, do you realize who came to my rescue last year and said, we're with you, Jim, and we want that 2% pay raise and was out beating the drum and everything. Who did that? Nobody. Nobody, Harvey. Nobody. Now, you can say what you want, but it's just fact. You know, it is absolutely just fact. Now, let me go one step further. Here's what happened. You had a vote in March that was going nowhere. Remember, this is a nothing vote. Because you had a budget proposed by the Republicans that was impossible for us to live with. Impossible. At that point in time, the, T, the, the Democrats all voted for the 2% pay rate. It, it was a vote that didn't mean anything. But when it got to crunch time in June, in the special session, just for the budget, when it got to crunch time, what happened? What happened? I mean, I can tell you the truth. You may have other people that are going to tell you something that's not the truth, but I have never, ever not told you the truth. Never. And I won't. Here's what happened. I beat on people until I was blue-green. And I went to the map for the 2% pay raise like nobody's business. I was asked over and over and over and over, how dug in are you on this? And I said, completely dug in. Because our teachers need that. Our teachers need that. We need to show them, even though it's only 2%, and I wish it could be a lot more, but we need to show them we appreciate it because these people feel beat down. 
Now that's what I did. Over and over and over. Now, here's what happened. Some way, somehow, by some hook or crook, the Republicans and their leader, Speaker Armstead, came right to my office and sat right with me and he said, I can't believe I'm going to do this. But in that proposal, in that proposal, there was the exemption of Social Security. There was a rebate check for the poorest of the poorest of the poorest. There was the exemption for the vets. There was a lessening as far as what we were going to take from higher ed. There was all kinds of good stuff for us. And the speaker said, I've got 26 votes for sure, and maybe as many as 30. But now you've got to go to your caucus, and you've got to get the rest of the votes. Had the 2% pay raise, exemption of Social, exemption of Social Security for, the, for, for all the elderly. Basically, I had a rebate check for the super poor. I had exemption for the vets, and on and on. Good stuff for hiring. I went to my caucus and I put on the dog and said, this is what we ought to do. It's the greatest deal in the world. Let's do it. 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 Now, I left knowing that we were going to do it. And in not long, the call came down from the mountain to Tim Miley, our speaker. I mean, not our speaker, but our president or whatever you call it. You know, Tim is used to be speaker, but they're not the majority now. The Democrats are. He went to Armstead and said, I can only deliver you three or four votes. He even went on one of the talk shows, I think, and said the same thing. Now, you need to listen. You need to listen. And you need to listen really closely. Now you've got politicians whether they be Republicans that didn't want you to have your 2% pay raise, or they be Democrats that voted 36 out of 36, only four were going to vote with you. And now they all want to run the streets and say, look at us, we're all with you. You need, to, you need more than this, and you need more than that. Were they? Where in the crap were they when it really counted? Where in the crap were they then? And I know where they were because I was one of them. Now, and at that point in time, that's when I became a Republican. Because I knew I wasn't going to keep battling the same battles and end up in the same spot. Now, here's the deal. On top of that, everybody kept saying the same thing. Everybody said just the same thing. Everybody said, well, if you give the teachers a 2% pay raise, what about everybody else in government? We want everybody else to get something, you know? And we couldn't do it because it would cost $47 million or some number like that. I think that was the number. We couldn't do it. What I had to try to sell them was this. We have to do it for the teachers because, for God's sakes, a living, we don't have even, have even have teachers in 700 classrooms. That's what I did. Now, so this year, you've got to make a decision if you're making it. You've got to make a decision. You're going to give a state of the state address. How are you going to get anything for you? How are you going to get there? The only way I knew to get there, the only way that I knew to get there was one way. And that is... Give everybody a raise. Give everybody a raise. So that's where I came up with the 1% to everybody, and next year another 1% to everybody. And then, and this idea came to me, and again, I don't know any, any way to tell you this other than just tell you the truth. This, I came to, this idea came to me from one of the union reps. One of the union reps sat right in my office and said, well, would you consider 1-1 one, one and a guaranteed 1-1-1? One, one, one? And I said, absolutely. If we can get that done, absolutely. And so that's where it all came from. Now, I would...
to tell you this just as straight up as I can tell you. And it doesn't matter if it's the Senate Republicans or the House Republicans or Jim Justice or the Democrats. It does not matter. I am telling you one thing. I wish to goodness that you could be paid substantially more money. And I'm speaking for all of them. But here's the question you have got to make up your mind on. And this is the real deal. Let's, let's switch to PEI just one second. PEIA, a lawful, I mean, you, can, you can't, no matter what anybody says, you know, politicians can feed you any bunch of crap. <coughs> but there's not many of us, me included, that understand every single piece of every single legislation that goes on. There's a lot about PEI that I, I'm still on a learning curve on to understand. And so you may ask a question today, and I may have to call on our chief of staff, Mike Hall, or somebody to help me with that. But just let me say, let me stay with PEI. I had no clue <coughs> that it was introduced through the PEIA people until basically there was a rumble in the jungle about this Go 365. That it was mandatory that you post your medical things or pay $25 more a month. I had no clue. As soon as I found out about it, what did I do? Shut it down. The very thing I did right off the get go. Your seniority issues, shut it down. You know, the other thing that came up in the PEI was this, was this, is that what they were doing is if you're two teachers in one household, they took your combined income and your premiums went up. Shut it down. That's exactly what I did. You know, just shut it down, shut it down, shut it down. Now, now let's get back to this. This part you're probably not going to like, but this is just fact. <clears throat> this state has always run this way. Here's, what it's, here's how it's run. You know, when things got a little bit better, people made <coughs> foolish moves. And all of a sudden then the things that were better collapsed and you went right back into wondering whether or not you're going to have a job or your kids are going to have a job or are you going to have to move out of state or are your kids going to have to move out of state and we went back to being dead last. My whole thought and then I'll be done unless and I'll let you ask whatever you want to ask. My whole thought was just this. The only way that I know that I can get it through the House and the Senate is give a raise to everybody. And I know there's no humanly way that I can give more than 1% to everybody today without exposing our state. And if you, now one thing you can't argue with me about is this. I'm the real deal as far as the business guy. The real deal. <coughs> And what I've done, judge me by my deeds. I walked into the God office dog's mess in the history of all time. And now we've turned it completely around. How do, you, do you think that just happened by falling off the wall? I mean, are you kidding me? That just didn't happen by that. And now you've got hope. And you've got a chance. I would tell you, I felt like the only way that I could get your pay to move was give something to everybody. And I still believe that everybody should get something. The only thing I would tell you is just there's still there's still ways in my mind to help with PEIA even more than we've already done. You know, even though the seniority issue, which I thought was completely crazy and everything, doing away with that and all that kind of stuff. And we 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 got rid of that and everything, but to go 365 and making you pay and making you post your medical records and all that kind of stuff, if you don't want to do that, you shouldn't do that. And as far as, as what we've done, as far as your household income going way up, now I would tell you this, if, you've got, if you're a teacher and your husband or your wife is a lawyer in downtown Charleston making $2 million a year, 
and, and she's living off of PEIA and basically it hurts everybody, then that's not right. That's not right. You know? And we ought to try to do something about that. If we don't, it hurts everybody. I mean, it hurts. It hurts the, the household with two state incomes. It hurts you so bad, it's unbelievable. Now, here's another thing we can do. We can phase in, you know, there's families, that, let's say they've got an income of 40 and they've got an income of 500, instead of just jumping to that higher pay, of which shouldn't affect them hardly at all, instead of just doing that, we can ramp that up and we can tear that in and phase that in. Now, let me tell you, the thing that you've got to decide is just this, is did you really trust me? Did I really perform for you? Did I really stand up for you? Do you really trust me? And if you do, then I would tell you just this, and I can't be more simple than just this. We in this state should not jump to a 3 or 4% raise today. What we should do is do just what I proposed. We should fix PEI to where it makes your life better. And you should trust in the fact that if, in fact, these numbers bear fruit and we just don't crash, I'll come right back in and bump you even more and bump you even more and get you where you want to go. Now, but I'm telling you, as a business guy, as a business guy, the smart money, you may say, well, why are you putting money in tourism or commerce? Well, just think. Just think. Be smart. Be smart. You know, if I put, for every dollar I put in tourism, it returns us right back that quick, eight times. Eight times. Now, if I put 20 million in tourism, but you say, well, we could put it in, 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 in the teacher's pay. We could. We could. But think about if I put 20 million in tourism and it brings us back in 160 million. And so the net of it is 140 million extra dollar. Then what could we do for? God says, let it just think. Be smart. Be really smart. I am your number one 800-pound cheerleader. And the only thing, and this hurts now, it really does. And you know, I can be the town redneck too. But when you're 800-pound number one cheerleader that loves you more than anything, and you got to remember the last thing is just this. I'm a teacher too. Do you realize I went back and got my teaching certificate so I could coach years ago? I'm a teacher too, and so is my wife. Now, it's no fun. It's no fun at all to be coaching a basketball game and have a bunch of you show up, and it's your right, but if a bunch of you show up and boo me, that's okay. But if you show up and boo little girls, then that's way past the edge. You know, and as my team was coming out, the girls were coming off the floor saying, why are they booing me? You know, now, I love you. And irregardless if you boo me or throw eggs at me or whatever, I'm still going to love you. Because, now I'm not going to love the person through the egg, but I am absolutely all in on education. All in. I've been there. I've shown it. I've said, judge me by my deeds. Fourteen times I've said, judge me by my deeds. Now, if you choose to respond to somebody that's a politician that's running through the streets that didn't stand with you any more than I can fly through the sky, then you're being dumb bunnies. If you stand with somebody that absolutely <coughs> has shown how much he loves you, I won't let you down. Now you ask me anything you choose to ask, please.
the format's going to be this. Um, again, I want to thank all of our employees for being here. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to come here. The only thing I ask is, if you got a question, I'm going to move. I want you to come here, address the question to the governor so we all can hear your question. And look here. Someone last night from Mingo County, uh, I don't have Facebook, but a number of y'all sent me the thing, Mr. Wolf, <coughs> said it's time to have a secret meeting here in Logan today. Ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing about me that's secret. I'm six foot eight and I weigh 300 pounds. This is being streamed live. <laughs> but this is being streamed live across the state. There's no one here trying to hide anything. No one's trying to be secretive in nature. No question you can ask today is off the table. I want you to come here. It's open mic. Right here it is. The one thing I ask is you do it in a professional and respectful manner. So with that, I appreciate all of you all. Governor, I'm proud of these people. These are my people. I'm proud of them too. And More than you'll ever know. With that, if you all want to come up here in an orderly fashion and ask your question to the governor, the mic's yours. I like that Marshall stuff too. Well, thanks for coming here. I think I say that on behalf of everybody. But uh, my question is uh, regarding PEI. And um, there are some in the community, um, uh, even politicians, that uh, get the idea of raising taxes to get us out of the mess of PEI. How do you respond to that? Raising taxes on fossil fuels. All right. Let me let me give you again the, the most honest answer a human being can give. You know, it's it's again you've got somebody running through the streets screaming, "Let's raise the natural gas sales tax two and a half percent." Okay. Now, sounds great, doesn't it? You got to get it through the Senate and the House. You'll never get it through. Now, sounds great, makes you feel good and everything else, but you got to get it through. And the other thing is just this. Who came out last year in the state of the state and said, what we need to do is tier the severance tax on gas and coal? Who did that? Me. I'm the guy. I'm the guy that said, as gas prices rise, as coal prices rise, those people should pay more because they make gigantic profits. Gigantic profits. If we would have done that, now just think about this for a second. Bob Murr, who is probably is the biggest thermal coal producer in the state, sat right in my office and together the two of us came up with the tier today. And really the Coal Association was behind it. And it went and it was on its way for the thermal tier. The metallurgical guys, you know, kind of pushed back a little bit, but for crying out loud, you know, if you've got a cost of $75 a ton and you're selling coal for $180 a ton or $150 a ton, think about what your profit margin is. And for crying out loud, if you would have had to pay another dollar and a half a ton, what would it have even mattered to you? We should have done it. We should have done it. If we would have done that last year, the severance income right now, right this minute, right now on coal, would have generated probably in excess of another $100 million. Right now. And it all blew up. It all blew up. You know when it blew up? In all honesty, we could have had it done with those 26 Republican votes. The Senate was already all on board. It blew up when we couldn't get the other votes from the other side. Now, say what you want. Say what you want, but that's exactly it. Now there's a proposal. I've already done this. I really believe the natural gas people, and you know, they don't really affect us a whole lot here and everything, although their sandwiches going all over everywhere, but the natural gas folks, 
The primary natural gas <coughs> veins and hubs and all that are in the northern part of the state, like the central part, or eastern, uh, you know, where, northern. Okay. Now let's say with We've got to find a way. I had them all in my office probably, I don't know, a month and a half ago. And I said, guys, it's just as simple. What they want is a thing called co-tendency or joint development, which basically is, is this. Is if, you're, if they have a track of land and every heir signs up on it except one and he's cousin Harry and they can't even find him and he's in Switzerland or whatever like that, they can't get the lease executed. Well, we need to help them there. And then, as far as joint development, you know, they don't want to drill a well here and come right over here and have to drill another well here. They want to pay these people over here for their mineral rights, but only drill one well, which to me makes sense too. Now, you got pushback from the Farm Bureau, but the Farm Bureau now, they're, they're in and they want to help out too. And I said to them just one thing. I said, you won't get me. You won't get me to be on your side if you're not willing to pay more or severance tax. You know, a tier. They said they're in. Now, to the answer to your question, it's just this. There's a lot of ways to fix BEI. There's a lot of ways to ensure that your costs are not going to do a movement and everything. Absolutely, we need to find a way, and we need to find a way through bringing in additional revenue, whether it be for the roads or oil and gas or whatever like that. But you see, that's where you have to make a real decision in this world. And it's hard to do because you've got people that are running out there spouting out stuff and they're doing it to get one thing, reelected. That's what they want. You see, that doesn't ever matter to me. Really and truly, at the end of the day, I don't want nothing from you. Nothing. All I want is goodness for you. It's a great big difference. You have a real oddball in me. I don't want access. I don't want money. I don't want you pat me on the back. I don't want nothing except goodness for you. Now, I don't know if we can get it through the gas people. I don't know if we can get that done. Because i got to get it done upstairs. I would be all for a tiering on natural gas that would today be bringing us in substantially more money. I would be all for tiering on coal that is going to be so much more difficult today than a year ago because a year ago, what I was doing is saying that if the price of coal drops, <coughs> the coal companies get a break from 5%. They get a break. Why shouldn't we have done that? Why in the world shouldn't we have done that? Because we could have kept more miners working if the price of coal dropped than sending them home. You know, but if the price of coal rose, we all got more money. Why in the world did we miss that opportunity? Now, the price of gold's up here, and you've got a lot of coal companies who are going to push back and say, oh, no, we don't want to just pay more. You know, well, I think you should. I do. So I'll try. That's all I can do. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. But let me, let me, let me tell you, say one last thing. Don't... <coughs> Don't get running through the streets screaming because somebody is rallying you up saying, by God, we can make them do this and we can make them do this and we can make them do this. We can bring them to the, to the knees doing this. And before you know it, all they're doing is running their mouth. All they're doing is just flat running their mouth. You know, and they're running their mouth to get your votes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma <clears throat> Governor, if fossil fuels are off the table, is there another um, source of um, a resource that we can use that can be sustainable uh, for teachers to have in the future for salaries now and in the future? For example, marijuana. You know, look what it's done for Colorado. 
A lot of that money goes to education. You know, we can do the same here. We have the perfect climate for it. We have the perfect land for it. We have workers who need jobs. I don't know what's holding this, this state back. We're always the last in everything. Everything we do, we're last. You know, eventually all these states will get on board and we'll be the 50th that say, oh yeah, we're gonna do that too. That's just the way it works. I went on strike in uh, 1990. At that time, we were 48 in pay. And we were told that, and I know you weren't the governor then, that our pay would continue to increase so that we could be competitive with other states. If you go to Maryland now, you make $20,000 more. That's a big difference. And we have not become competitive. And now we're right back at 48. And we're never going to be, you know, we have teachers leaving this state in droves. And more planning to go. Look at all the vacancies we have now that can't be filled. I think we need a steady source of um, revenue coming in, sustainable, that is dedicated for that one purpose, public employees of raises. And I think marijuana might be the answer, and I don't know why that hasn't been looked at more thoroughly. Or maybe it has, and the evangelical base is against it. I don't know. I don't know what the reasons are, but I think it's something that needs to be explored. You know, it's a can bring in money, and evidently West Virginia needs money. There might be something to be looked at. Thank you. Okay, let me comment on that real quick. First of all, again, if, if I were to, to introduce the bill today, it ain't gonna pass. There's just no human way. It's not gonna pass. The other thing is, is this, we have a drug, drug epidemic in this state that's out of control beyond, beyond belief. And I wouldn't be in favor of doing that today until at least we get our feet underneath us and get this drug epidemic to where it's manageable. I mean, right now, you know how bad it is. We can't even feel the workforce and everything, and it is a mess beyond belief. You are correct in one thing, and that is just this. Absolutely, we should have a revenue source that should be not necessarily dedicated directly to the teachers or to education or government workers or whatever, but we should have some way to ensure a revenue source that will help you as time goes on in the future. And you are correct about the fact that there are promises maybe in 1990 you know, the things we're going to, they, they will keep up with other states or whatever like that, and they didn't do it, you know. Now, the one thing that you're not, well, that you, I don't know if you've taken this into consideration or not, but you didn't, you've only had me for 12 months, you know. Now, and you've seen the things that I'm doing, and you've seen all of a sudden the hope of revenue really changing within our state. Let me, just, let me just give you an example of what could happen. Think about this a second. We've not really seen the economic kick in of the road situation at all, have we? I mean, we've seen a little bit, but we haven't seen it kick in because we haven't seen all the people with the jobs and all that stuff. What if I were to say to you this, and I just imagine this, and this could happen. But again, I'm the guy that wants to be smart rather than penny wise and pound poor and end up in a dog's mess. Think about what, ha what could happen if this happened. What could happen if all of a sudden it did generate 40,000 new jobs? And think about the calculation of the payroll tax on that. The fact that just the calculation of either the income tax, the payroll tax, whatever it may be, could very well be $200 million. Now that's the money you're looking for, right there. It could be right here, right at our fingertips, but let me tell you one step even further. That $200 million is going to spin back, and not only that, but the wages on top of that are going to be spun back into our economy in lots of different ways. And before you know it, the multiplier effect of those dollars could actually turn into hundreds more million dollars. And all of a sudden, then you could have the sprout up of things like an incredible tourism boom or whatever it may be for southern West Virginia. And on top of that, you may even very well have a situation where, and I tried till I was blue green with the president and everything, to get through this Homeland Security incentive 
that would, you know, at one time there was 197 million tons of coal mined in West Virginia. When I took over, we were in the seven. Now, now we're going to probably come in at the low 90s. 197 million at one time. What if we could get back to 120 million tons? Well, there's your money. There's your money. Oh, back double triple. What if we could get to tearing on the natural gas? Well, there's your money. What if this China thing comes through? Well, there's your money. You know, what I'm trying to say to you is we are right on the cusp. We're right on the fence. You've got a governor that is so in your court it's unbelievable. We're right on the cusp of being able to go the other way and to really do something for you that has never been thought of before. And that is genuinely crawl you out of 48th and crawl you up to 10th or something like that, which would make all of those, all of you in your field wonderful. Fix PDIA and do all. And you know, and whether you buy it or not buy it, but the Republicans in the Senate and the Republicans in the House and the Democrats on both sides, they want to do it too. But they just don't know how to do it. In a lot of ways, they don't know how to do it. And I do. I really do. Now, the Republicans that are with me in the Senate and the Republicans that I have been in conversation with in the House, they feel the same. Now, I don't know what will come out of the House because they're a loose cannon in a lot of ways, and, and everybody will tell you that. But the Republicans in the Senate feel the exact same way. Let's just tip our toe in the water and just give me a few more months and then see what I really do. Don't react to, my God, living, please don't react to politicians that are running up and down the road and they're telling you things that really, in a lot of instances, are not the truth and they're wanting to get reelected. Be smart for once. Just be smart and know that if you've got 10 extra dollars, what we should do with that 10 extra dollars is invest it. That's what we should really do. We should invest it. That will make your lives right for years and years to come. And if we don't, you could end up right back in the god-awful dog's mess that you've been in before. You could get another percent or two pay raise right now. And you could end up going back where the conversation last year all over the place was, we're going to have to go to 7030 on the PEI. Wasn't it? Wasn't that the conversation? Because we didn't have anywhere else to turn, did we? That, I mean, and if you don't think that was a conversation, you're silly. You're silly if you didn't, because I heard it a thousand times. Now, you could be penny wise and pound poor, or you can depend on the guy that has stood right rock solid with you, and you will be so happy if, in fact, the, the goodness that we have pans out. If it doesn't pan out, well, then you are where you are. If, if you don't watch out, you know, what you could very well do is just tip things the wrong way. All I can say to you, and then I'll take another question, all I can say to you is just what I've said in the campaign. I said it in the state of the state last year. I said it in the state of the state this year. I've said it with the Republicans and the Democrats on Blue Green. I stand right with you. Now you can throw eggs at me and boo me and do whatever you want. But I'm telling you today, the smart money is for us to try to figure a way to help PEI more than we already have. Figure a way to help PEI and you give me a little time. And see if I don't reward you with a life, a life that's better than a book of green stamps today. I mean, I can, I can, I can whip on you a book of green stamps today and make you feel a little bit better today.
And then all of a sudden, if the numbers just don't work, one other thing I'd like to just throw in just this, and, that, and, that, and that's this right here. The January numbers just came out. We project what we think they're going to be. And, and I've got great accountants that are doing this all the time, and they project the numbers. Now, we haven't published this and everything because we're just fine-tuning and everything. We kind of thought that this may happen this way. The January numbers came in $28 million short of what we projected. What if we're wrong? What if we're really wrong about this goodness that we think is happening? What if we're wrong? What if I can't get through anything to do with the tearing and severance tax? What if we're wrong? Then you're right back into the same rut in life you've been in forever. But what if I'm right? And what if I come through for you? Then you have a life. You don't have a book of green stamps today. You have a life. That's what I'm trying to deliver you in West Virginia. I'm trying to deliver you the life that your kids will have a place here to work and that you'll be compensated properly and your PEI will be good and absolutely you'll be able to drive on a road without tearing your car all to pieces. I'm trying to deliver you a life. If you don't get it, well, you just don't get it. And somebody else has something, please. We've got a lot of Marshall people here, and I'm loving that. <coughs> Remember, I'm a graduate, my wife's a graduate, and my daughter's a graduate. So am I. Good news. Uh, I'd like to clarify, you are in support of a gas severance tax, correct? I am, I am in support of the tiering of the natural gas. And by that I mean, let's make sure everybody understands. You had a base level of, I don't know, $2. And at $2, you were, we were 5%. We are 5% on everything, okay? But as we rose up, the gas, I, I am 100% behind, they should pay more. The same thing on the car. I wanted to, to put in a base, a metallurgical coal, say $100. Say up to, up to $100, you pay 5%. But above that, you gradually went up some more. That's what I'm going to pay. Okay. Um, could you explain why you believe that our representatives wouldn't get behind that? Why you believe that it wouldn't pass? And then I have another question after that. Well, all I can say is this. Did it pass? Well, I, I see that I see that there's a bill that's going to be on the table in the Senate, by, uh, sponsored by Senator Ojeda. Could you speak to that bill and if you would support it? I, I haven't seen the bill, but uh, Senator Ojeda has a lot of enthusiasm. I've got to give him that and everything. But but I haven't seen the bill. But uh, I would doubt very seriously that he would even get out of the committee. Can you speak to why you don't believe it would get out? Because I don't hear of senators in in that are in favor. I mean, I, I don't have, I don't hear senators in support. You know? I don't I don't know the details of the bill. I've said that in a second. Let me say it one more time. If you want to get something through as far as tearing on severance tax on gas, you need to put together a program in which they'll get something now because now you're asking at the wrong time. You know, that's the problem. We had it last year. We had it done. You know, and the last minute, everybody started diving in the, in the ditch and everything because they were a political animal that everybody was hacking up with one another. Just is what it is. I mean, I mean, literally, the Democrats dove in the ditch last year because Senator Carnes wanted some level of tax reform and the lowering of the income tax rate, and he only, and, and, the, and we negotiated, and negotiated, and negotiated, and the only, the only thing. Understand, the only people that that would have affected are people that had an income less than $100,000. Everybody in the upper middle to the lower income classes, they were the beneficiaries. The rich wouldn't get anything. That's what we did. But even 
there. The Democrats couldn't stand it. They couldn't stand it. And so therefore, they let all the things go that I told you about before. Social Security exemption, your 2% pay raise, all of the veteran stuff, they let it go. Because they were hacking up with farmers. That's my feelings. That's exactly my feelings. Now, if you want to pass something that seems logical, well, we we'll just tack we'll just another 2.5% on the, onto the gas companies. Look, and again, I'm just telling you the truth. That's all I'm going to do. There's gas companies running all over that capital everywhere, and they're lobbying every delegate in the world. It won't get off the drain. It won't. Now, my opinion, I mean, I could be wrong. How you can get it off the ground is co-tendency and joint development and tier. Just ask them two and a half percent right off the cop to do, you won't get it off the ground. Now you can raw raw you, but you're not going to get it off the ground. Thank you. Uh, my other question is in regards to PEIA. Um, you spoke earlier that PEIA will be considering uh, changing the total family income portion for spouses who are both state workers, correct? Right. How would that affect a state worker who, whose spouse it works in the private sector who may have the same income as two state workers, but yet they're going to be under the total family income penalty? You have to answer that, Mark. <coughs> I was good on two state workers. But I don't know how. Let, let me make sure I get the question straight. If the total family income is the same? Well, e even if it's not the same, from what, I, has, from what I understand about the proposal is if you have two state workers, they're considering taking their salary and adding together, dividing right. by two to get the average to put them in their tier. Right. Um, however, is, am I correct in assuming that a state worker married to someone who works in the private sector will still have their combined income without an average and based into a higher salary tier. That's exactly correct. That's unfortunate. But let me, let me talk about it a little bit. Let me give you sure, a couple of you. examples. But I've given you the honest answer. What the PI, and that, that can be reversed, by the way. That, that We can change that policy. There's no question about it. You can go back to where you were last year. You can go back to 10 tiers, and there's conversation to do that and to let this thing rest for a while. However, let me point out something to you that I'm not sure has been talked about uh, in great detail. So if you'll just give me a second, I'll pull this up. What they did basically was this. When the PIA board was charged with the responsibility in the past to set the premiums based on ability to pay, that's the concept. Then you look at you look at the whole group of people. Here's what did not happen. PIA's premium is going to be at about 560 to 70 million dollars. That doesn't change because. As you said, it's unfortunate, and you actually would be, you would be paying in the situation you said would be paying more. But there's not going to be more premium collected. So what happens is somebody's going to be paying less. And so the question is, who is that? And they went into the plan and they said, um, let me just read you just some examples. For a person making under $30,000 a year who's single, it's in PIA. Their old premium last year was $81. Their new premium is $59. They'll save $22 a month. Their old deductible was $375. Their new deductible will be $275. They'll save $100 in the deductible. And should they access the plan, they, they're out of pocket in the old <coughs> last year was $2,100. Their new will be $17.75. So for somebody who is the lowest income person in PIA, service personnel or whatever, the new projected plan saves them $689. If you're single and making under $60,000, the scenario is similar. Your old premium was $132, your new will be $81. You'll save $612 if you're under $60,000 and single. The, your deductible will be $225 less. It was $600 last year. It'll be $375 this year. Your out-of-pocket would change. 
you, you, you would save 575, your annual savings, if you would have a medical event, would be $1,412. When you go to the employee whose spouse together, they make 60,000. These would be the lowest income people. Where you have an employee, service personnel perhaps, their spouse works fast food or whatever, they're under 60. Their actual annual savings is $4,000. So the way the PI board looked at this was, the only way, the, the fairer thing to do in the ability to pay concept was this. For years, we know, I absolutely know to a certainty, I've got at least 10 examples I can give you, and some from this county, of people who may be lawyers and doctors, business people, whose teacher spouse makes 30 or 40,000, and they latch onto that because there's no cost to them. I know a businessman in Spencer that owned a very successful business up there, making a lot of money, but every one of those people, none of them were on their company plan. So they didn't pay. So here's what happens. We're going to collect, to make the plan whole, $560 million. The question is, in the ability to pay question, do you bring in spousal income? Now, if you do, what you're able to do then is help these lower pays get a break. I don't, this is part of what hasn't been clearly communicated. Now, we recognize, and I'll explain this, several of you, 5, 000, there are 47,000 PIA participants. 22,000 of you are single. 5,000 of you are married. 5,000 of you, and this is PI participants, this is teachers, state employees, county commissions, anybody that could qualify for PIA, there's 5,120. What the governor said that we just have proposed to the PI board, they have to take action, but they will on February 20th after some public hearings. What, they're, what we're doing is saying, all right, in that instance, then we will go ahead and let that family count both incomes divided in two, and they'll be put bumped from a higher tier to a lower tier. Now, in order to do that, in order to do that, the numbers I just read to you for the lowest pay will go up 6%. Because if the premium is not being collected anymore, so the concept was it was ability to pay. And they looked at it and said, is it fair that we allow all these spouses out here, some of whom are extremely wealthy, who attach to this plan while the lowest pay pay for it? So I, that's a different construction of the PI problem in terms of fixing. There is a suggestion that we just go back to last year. So if we go back to last year, those low paid people's pay premiums will be higher and the high paid people's premiums will be lower. It's, it's that. So the challenge of the finance board was in, in, in trying to uh, deal with the ability to pay concept is that's what they did. And I recognize, as in anything, as what you just said, there are winners, in this case, the winners are the lower paid people in this plan. And the losers are the higher paid people who now have to bring in spousal income or whatever. Now, your spousal income can be adjusted. Those of you who are good tax people know adjusted gross income. I mean, you could actually have a loss. And you, you can create a an adjusted gross income, because that's the number that's going to be used, that could actually, you could work it out to where you could financially plan and keep, your, keep yourself in a lower tier. But that's where we are. The decision that's being made right now with the legislature in this confusion is, why don't we just go back and let it rest for a year and just go back to where we were, Governor? That's what we're talking about doing. But understand if you do that, that there are some people that are actually winners in this, They'll be back to where they were, and some, and so that's what we are. I hope that, I hope that answers the question. That, that's, that's why the finance board made the decision. <clears throat> if you want to follow up, well, I'll, it, it seems to me from you reading those numbers that it would make financial sense for the majority of married people in this state that are on PEIA to get a divorce. You're right. It's the same as true with Social Security, and a lot of people have done it. <coughs> But, but you're, you're, you're correct, but I'm not, I'm not arguing the right or the wrong of this. I am simply describing why the decision was made the way it was. Sure, and, and, I, and I appreciate that. And I understand uh, people who are wealthy latching onto the PEI system, you know, I, I'm not even going to get into that. 
but the idea of taking two state workers, if they have a $40,000 a year salary, both of them, and you average it out to $40,000 a year, how is their ability to pay any different than a state worker making $40,000 a year whose husband works in the private sector at $40,000 a year, and yet they're in the $80,000 a year tier? You're correct. I, I agree. I agree completely with you. I, I absolutely and agree. And we need to take that back and try to do something about that. I you. agree completely with you. Yeah, you're correct. Thank you. And, and, and let me, let me, this is for my knowledge. Let me just say, ask this. There's two, there's two proposals that, that are floating around. There's everything floating around. You know that. But, but what if, 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 what if it were to come back to you that we're just going to do a moratorium on PEI? We're going to leave it exactly like it is right now. You know, is that good or bad? I mean, do you like that or not like it? Tell me. It's better than the proposed. Well, raise your hand. Like it or not like it? Like? Can I be halfway in the middle? Because I agree. No, I agree. Like it. It's better than the proposal right now. Okay. Then, then how many don't like it? I also don't like it because we're not fixing the PEIA. Okay. All right. All right. But, but just you give me good information. Let me just say this, and Paul, you're dead on the mind, you know, about that. But let me just ask this. What if we could, what if we could do a moratorium on it for a year or two years until we really saw, we really saw, you know, and, and, and that's where it gets back to trusting me. We really saw that we were really okay to where then we could change that 1111 and bump you even more and everything. And in addition to that, and in addition, now we could do three things. Here. Moratorium, don't change anything. Stay where we are in the 1111 just until we see our way clear. And then you got to trust me. you got to trust the guy that's sitting up here, you know, that's giving this stool a workout and everything. But at the same time, you got to trust me to know that I'm all in. I'm all in. All I got to know is for sure, for sure we're okay. Because I'm going to kill you and this state, if all I do is put you back to where your kids are running out of state and everything else, and the state's upside down and everyone. I am. I am. All I got to know is just a little more surety, and then I'm all in. Now, so we do that, and we do the moratorium, and then the other thing we do is this, is we go back, and we listen to these good people that have been here and say, now let's try to work on a plan that really does bring us revenue from some budget, whether it be sales tax on gas or roads or whatever it may be, that does fix PEI. Now, Dr. what if I can't do I have this? a question with the PEI. Yes, um, my husband is a state worker, mm -hmm. okay? Um, if it stays the way it is, right now we get a discount. Right. Because we both are, you know, employees. Will that remain? If it goes well, if it stays the way, the way it's going to stay, it's going, it's going to remain. Okay. Now he's getting ready to retire. Okay. Next month. Will they count like his retirement plus Social Security, or just if they go to the other when they count the two incomes? I hate to let him talk more because he talks too blooming <laughs> much. <laughs> Sorry. But you've got to just answer the question. Yes, sir. <laughs> it, on the retirement side, he, he comes under the retirement benefit, and I'm told that the income does not. Uh, is not counted. No. So it would just be because he, 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 he is the carrier right now, but as of next month, I will have to pick he it up. He comes under your math. Okay. Right. Okay, I've got one more question for you. And, and it, you know, this is testimony to, you know, because... It, it, in any crisis, when you've got people that are running the streets, and whether it be Democrats or Republicans, you know, maybe maybe it's a situation where the Republicans are running the streets and, and they're rah rah on you and everything. Today, the Democrats are running the streets and rah rah on you like crazy, and they've got you all stirred up as they can bitch you. And all I would say to you is be smarter than this. Be smart, because I am telling you the gospel fact truth. Ask where they were before, whether it be Republicans or Democrats, be smart. Just be smart. But one thing I can tell you, this was in my office yesterday. And this came from the Speaker, the Speaker of the House, Tim Armstead. He said, there is some discussion going on, and what do you think about this, Governor? You know, there's some discussion going on to say, what we'll do is 
Never, never will we go above a 20% demand from you, and never will we go below the 80. Okay? Now, and, 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 and initiating putting that in law, and then in addition to that, then looking at the dollars we have today, and maybe today we can go to an 82% or something this year, and maybe as dollars come in, we can eat that up to an 84 or 5, and all of a sudden you're getting another bump from that. Is that a good idea or bad? Too complicated or not too complicated? Because I know y'all are smarter than I am, but is that a bad idea? It's not a bad idea. No. It's a very good idea. Well, it's a good idea. It, it's really the, the solution that I've been considering because right now at exactly 20% and exactly 80%, the more money you put in PEIA, <coughs> the more we have to put in PEIA. So okay. All right. All right. Let me one more time say just this. What, and, and I don't, you know, I, I mean, this is just... What I'm trying to, to get over to you is just this, is yeah. don't throw the Republicans under the bus because they're really trying to come up with solutions to help you too. And don't throw the Democrats under the bus either, you know, because I believe they're good people and they're trying to. All right. Now, so let's just, let's just be honest. What I want to know is this, and I can gain real knowledge. What if, I, what if we were able to go back and just do this? What if we were saying, okay, we're going to do a moratorium here until we see if justice is economics are real. And, and really, and once we see that they're real, and I believe they're real with all in me, then we're going to be off and going. And we're going to try to do the increase in gas severance, and we're going to try to do all the other stuff. We're going to try to do it. I don't know if we can get it done, but we're going to sure try to do it. But I think the economics are going to work, and we're going to get going. But what if I were to say, tell you what, let's do. Let's just freeze, freeze PEIA today. You know, and freeze it for this year, maybe next year, something like that, to where, to where we knew. And then in addition to that, let's try to work on a solution that's a long-term solution to fix PEIA forever. I can't do that in, in a week. There's no way. I can't do it until I know that we got real money coming from somewhere or legislation <laughs> passed that we're going to increase gas severance or something like that. So all I can do is just work on that. Okay. But then let's just say we have a moratorium on PEI, and then in addition to that, we put in the caveat that says 80% max, or 20% max, 80%, you know, and, and, and when we have dollars, we move the 80 to 82 or 84 or something like that. But the lowest we can go is 80 and the 20, you know, or, or vice versa if I've got that screwed up. Would that be good? Yes. 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 As long as we can pay for it. <laughs> as long as the state can pay for it. I mean, I, we have to but you see, I think I think what what really if we go to if we go to freezing the eighty to twenty, you know, then you've got some certainty that you're going to build a house here and live in West Virginia. You know, you've got some certainty then, and. Going forward, we've got to be able to, surely to God above, take care of our service personnel and our teachers and the people that are influenced our kids. I mean, you know, we've got, we got to take care of them. You know, and, and so it gives you some certainty. And then from the standpoint of the state, you know, because as soon as I get through with you, I'm going to go to Lewisburg and do one of these two, but then I'm going to turn right around and go right back to Charleston, and I'm going to say, okay, I think we've got a solution here, and this is what we ought to do. And I'm going to try like crazy to pull it off. Because in the future, as we go forward, in the future, I believe Jim Justice believes with all his heart that he's going to come right back to you and to stay in the state next year and bump you even more and maybe bump you substantially because I think things are going to be that good. I really do. But I'm smart enough to know. You know, let me... Let me let me end by saying this. And I want to end with this. Now you've heard me talk, and you've seen me, and you've seen me coaching the Logan Field House over here, and you've seen me all over this place. You've seen what I do. I mean, Lord above, you should have seen, you should have taken notice, and I don't want credit for this in any way because it was the only right thing to do, but 
We had the worst event that I've ever seen, a thousand-year flood. And here you own the Greenbrier Hotel, and my God, a living carpet in there costs $5 million a foot. And the very first thing, what did I do? I said, just open it to anybody and everybody to come because these people are really hurt. Well, that's me. But if I were to say to you, if I were to say to you, this ties back to where I am and where I worry about the money. If I were to say to you, what do I think is the best trait that I have? What do I think is the best trait that I have? What would you say? That's something. My God, surely you think there's something good about My it. impression of you is that you think your best trait is your honesty. Okay, I'll buy that. What else? Somebody else say something. Genuine. I'm sorry? Genuine. Genuine. Okay. But we're not, I'm not going to pull it out of you and everything, but let me tell you. The very best trait that I think I have is the ability to doubt myself. The ability to say to yourself, do you really know for sure that things are going to be okay? And I don't. I really think they are. But I don't really know for sure. And I'm going to tell you, I love you too much, and I love the people of this state too much, to run you off a cliff on something that I think that I really don't know for sure. And that's exactly what I've been trying to say. I mean it. I'll go back and try to accomplish those three things right there that I just said a minute ago. And we'll make headway with this. And then just give me time. And you will have a grin on your face bigger than Yogi Bear. Wait a second. Governor, I appreciate you coming to Logan. And again, I want to thank my people. When I call you my people with fondness and affection. I ask you to go back to your respective buildings, talk to your colleagues, tell them what you've learned today. And I'm, I'm not ashamed to tell you, I've talked to the governor this weekend, and I told him, I said, look, I've heard from our people. PEIA is a big problem. All people want is predictability. And this problem is decades in the making. The solution is not going to be in a 30 days slip in this session. We talked about the moratorium. If you do it for another year, you've got a 17, 18 month window to work and do it right. Maybe you impanel a commission, something like the Blue Ribbon Road Commission, to where you get representatives from the state <coughs> there that are part of the part of the conversation, talk about the real issues, and bring the questions that Chris brought up and others, because they need real answers. But I want to thank you all for the way you conduct yourself today, your professionals in every sense of the word. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And Governor, for the past 20 months, I've asked a lot out of these people. We inherited a train wreck here in the school system two years ago. Had to lay off 100 people. They burned through $24 million in unencumbered cash. My two colleagues back here, I can't thank them enough. We roll up our sleeves. We try to be transparent for our people. We've got nothing to hide. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart and safe travels back to your schools. Let me say one other thing before you leave. Paul is exactly right on one thing. The idea of the possibility of freezing PEIA or the moratorium, that's that man right there. He's the man who came up with that idea and brought it to me. And uh, he's a good man. And he cares an awful lot about where he lives in his county and you. So, uh, and you have been really good. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't want to shake your hands. I don't want to shake your hands because I don't, I, I really, I don't want to get this flu. <laughs> 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 <laughs>